In the last video, we discovered the basic thermal principles, but in this video, we will learn how to use thermals more efficiently. What is our objective when we go gliding? Do we just want to have fun, or do we have some ambitions to go beyond and extend our flight, possibly up to a few hundred kilometers? This is an example flight path in my early days, which was a four hours flight with no goal. Take a look at this recording in contrast, captured after hundreds of flights later, where I successfully completed a 40-kilometer triangle during an internal club challenge. Now you will ask, how can I be sure that there is a thermal on my way? Unfortunately, the answer is you can't be sure. But luckily, you can increase your chances by landscape and cloud investigations. When inspecting our landscape, we will find some potential heat sources and tear off edges, large asphalt or concrete surfaces, a tractor that creates air movement, a terrain edge, field, forest borders, industrial plants or greenhouses, sunlit rocky mountain slopes, our favorite. When we start flying cross country, we have to imagine the landscape below us as a collection of bubbling geysers. Some just started a bubble, some are active, and some just disappeared. We have to find our best way through this jungle, harvesting just enough altitude to reach the next upwind. There is a lot of theory out there to optimize our cross-country speed, which thermal to take, when to leave, and more. For now, we are happy to stay up in the air, moving along in our desired direction. One simple rule in thermals is, don't rush through the upwind. If you fly slower, of course always within limits, you spend more time in the updraft and automatically use more of this precious energy. If you rush through with too much speed, you give away the lift that could have been harnessed to gain altitude. This technique is also known as dolphin style. It is challenging to predict the exact lifespan of a thermal, but we can categorize them into a few distinct types. First, there's the one-time wonder, where a single burst of air, along with its thermal bubble, is released, but lacks the energy to produce a second pulse. Then, there's the pulsar type, where after one packet of warm air ascends, another forms, creating a cyclical, pulsating pattern. Finally, in certain conditions, like when the sun heats mountain rock walls, thermals can generate a continuous steady upward stream of air lasting for several hours. Another effect that you will discover with more practical experience is the following. The upwind will push you away from its center. The animation should illustrate this. The wing next to the updraft is lifted, giving you a momentum away from the lift. You have to actively pilot your plane into the lifting area. We haven't covered the complete story of thermals yet. A simple rule is that what goes up must come down. It's important to note that the ascending air creates a sort of vacuum that needs to be filled. In the simplified animation, this is represented by the blue air. 
This phenomenon explains why we frequently encounter an area of increased downwind flow just before we enter the core of the thermal. In this video snippet, we can clearly observe the following sequence. Our glider maintains a sink rate of 0.6, but suddenly the sink rate increases and the air becomes more turbulent. This indicates that we are entering the zone where air descends to fill the vacuum beneath the thermal bubble. This phenomenon is often accompanied by a noticeable increase in speed. As we approach the core of the updraft, the sinking transitions into climbing, signaling that we've found the thermal lift. As told in the basics video, life isn't that simple. As a first example, we ask, how do you know lift is increasing? Yes, the variometer gives you a hint, but it is a few seconds late. So when you see the variometer shows increasing sink rate, you have already flown for two seconds in the downwind area. Take a look to this situation. The plane already is in the downwind before the variometer shows negative values, and respectively, it is also too late when indicating the updraft. If we purely rely on this instrument, we will miss the moment when to turn into our thermal. It is better to trust your guts. You will learn this with more training. When we think we've encountered an updraft, which direction should we turn, left or right? Here's an educated approach. If you feel the left wing lift, turn left. If the right wing feels lifted, turn right. If there's no clear physical indication, but you're approaching a cloud, aim for the darkest part of it. And if all else fails, you still have a reasonable 50-50 chance of choosing the correct direction. The strongest lift is found in the inner core of a thermal. So our goal when gliding is to center our turns to maximize efficiency and take advantage of the strongest updraft. But how do we achieve this? There are various methods, but the one we'll describe here is simple and effective. As you feel the lift increasing, reduce the sharpness of your turn, because anyway, you're moving toward the stronger part of the thermal. Conversely, if the lift weakens, tighten your turn as you're drifting toward the weaker areas. By constantly adjusting your turns this way, you'll gradually center yourself in the core of the thermal, optimizing your lift. What bank angle should we aim for when circling? The answer is, as usual, it depends. There are broad and narrow updrafts, some weaker and some stronger. If you encounter a narrow lift, it is obvious that you circle very steep with a small curve radius to stay in the updraft. But don't forget, a high bank angle comes with higher speed and more gliding inefficiency.
In contrast, if you are in a broad and weak thermal, it is wise to do very flat turns with a bigger radius. It's an optimization task. We have to find the sweet spot between curve radius and thermal usage. Otherwise, you risk either inefficiently using the thermal or being pushed out of it entirely. Let's have a quick look to this weather situation. Clouds are forming, moving and disappearing. We should have a more detailed look to their appearance. We are specially interested in cumulus clouds that appear as small white fluffy patches, often covering some portions of the sky. They typically have a flat dark bottom and resemble a field of wool on their top, giving them the appearance of a flock of sheep. So we call them often sheep clouds. When we plan our flight path, we should aim for the young and able clouds because they potentially have the best upwind. When you take only one snapshot, you cannot differentiate between old and young ones. You have to watch them over time. Compare this to video snippets of a fresh new growing cloud and an old vanishing one. By the way, thermals can also exist with no visible cloud on top. And sometimes they gather in so-called streets. Flying along a cloud street is extremely efficient. Hopefully the cloud street direction points somehow to your next waypoint. Over time, centering the core will be easier for you because controlling the glider is easier with more experience. You will have more capacities free to observe the situation. By the way, there is one strict rule. When entering a thermal, choose the same direction as the one who was first. While in the thermal, try to watch the clouds every circle and imagine a time-lapse recording of their appearance. Soon, you will discover your favorites, as here in this example, the left one is to choose. This video will hopefully give you more insight into mastering thermals. Remember that the animations shown here are idealized replicas of the real world, which is much more complex and doesn't behave exactly like in the textbook. However, with more practice, you will gain experience and your thermaling efficiency will improve. Last but not least, there is still more to learn, such as the temp dew point graph, McGrady's theory and strategies to further enhance your gliding skills. Stay tuned to this YouTube channel for more information. See you next time.